The Columbia Broadcasting System presents Service Time, a daily series Monday through Friday. Every Tuesday afternoon, this program will be devoted to the men who sail the ships of the United States Merchant Marine. In cooperation with the War Shipping Administration, Columbia brings you It's Maritime. <laughs> dramatizing the history and color of the American merchant marine. Superstitions of the sea, stories of humor and adventure, tales of heroism and daring. This afternoon, you will hear about a race between clipper ships back in 1856 and a rescue under fire during the 1944 invasion of Normandy. Vice Admiral Emery S. Land will award a newly authorized medal to a hero of the merchant marine. There will be music with Warrant Officer Philip Lang directing the Maritime Service Orchestra from the United States Maritime Service Training Station at Sheepshead Bay. Every war has inspired men to write music. Back in the Civil War, some anonymous soldier whistled a tune to himself as he marched with his squad along a dusty road in the south. And pretty soon, that song was being whistled all across this land of ours. It was called, When Johnny Comes Marching Home. Just last year, another fellow thought it might be a good idea to use that old tune as a theme for a new march. This fellow's name is Morton Gould, and he calls his march American Salute.
no women in our maritime service today, but back in the 19th century, one American girl achieved great fame as a sailor. Her name was Mary. Mary had always been irresistibly drawn to the sea. One day, she met and fell in love with Joshua Patton, owner and master of the clipper ship Neptune's Car. They were married when Mary was only 16. And on his next voyage, the captain took his young wife along. The sailors were suspicious at first, a woman aboard ship. But soon she had the entire crew at her feet. Mrs. Patton, <clears throat> well, there she ain't like other females I've seen. Oh, she's a beautiful lady with a refined voice and gentle manner, all right, but she's a sailor. You know, the captain's lady is studying navigation. Yes, sir, Navigation. Mary Patton learned navigation from her husband as they sailed around the world. She learned how to box a compass and shoot the sun. It was perhaps inevitable that the good ladies of San Francisco did not quite approve. I certainly do not approve of Mary Patton, sailing from port to port without any destination, like a piece of baggage. She's been all over the world. A sea bell, that's what they call them in the Orient, a captain's wife who lives aboard ship. <laughs> Imagine being called a sea bell. Francisco Dowagers never bothered Mary Patton. She and Joshua sailed the seven seas. Mary saw all the strange and wonderful land she had dreamed about. China, India, Africa, and the peaceful virgin green islands of the Pacific. Those were happy years for Mary and Joshua. Their life was an idol of blue skies and sunny seas until one two-starred voyage. <laughs> Again. Do you suppose we could touch her on our next voyage, Joshua? Joshua? Yes, ma'am? You haven't heard a word I said. Darling, what is it? We haven't sighted the flying star in two days. Yes, I know. You mustn't get to Frisco ahead of us. If she wins this race, get their cargo of silk there first and ruined. Only my first mate hadn't been hurt last week. How is Mr. Wainwright? I went to his cabin before dinner. His leg is very bad. He won't be able to resume his duties on this voyage. That's when I need all hands, please. Joshua, let me take his place. What? I know navigation. You taught me yourself. That's out of the question, my dear. But you can't do the work of two men. But I must. Uh, Joshua, why don't we forget about the race? Put back the cake, Helen. You could take Mr. Wainwright to a surgeon and find another first mate to take his place. No, my dear. There isn't time. We've got to get our cargo to Frisco ahead of the flying star. The two sleek slippers, the flying star, and Neptune's car raced on across the South Atlantic with their cargoes of silk. Week after week, they battled the fury of Cape Horn. Now fighting through the flying winds of the Antarctic, now becalmed in a silent gray sea. And Captain Patton continued to perform the duties of his injured first mate. Finally, he was stricken himself as a result of long hours of exposure to sun and wind and rain. Mary Patton had caught it all in the ship's lot. October 10th. Captain Patton is confined to his cabin with brain fever. Fortunately, the second mate is an expert seaman. With his help, I have taken over my husband's duties. We sighted the flying star at sunset on the horizon of Cape Horn. I will endeavor to overtake her at the earliest possible moment. November 8th. Captain Captain's affliction progresses daily. His sight is failing as a result of the brain fever. We last sighted the flying star more than a week ago. Due to heavy seas and treacherous winds, we have not yet overtaken her. December 3rd. Captain Catton is completely blind as a result of the fever. Our 
am certain that my dear husband will never regain his sight. We have been buffeted by the elements. We have managed again to come within sight of the flying star. For Joshua's sake, I desperately trust that we will overtake her. Good. We've almost reached the end of our voyage. We can keep ahead of her today. We'll win the race. We're going to keep ahead of her, darling. Harry, yeah, did you hear? Oh, look out. We've sighted land. We've won the race. Yes, darling. We have won. Soviet Russia has many women in her merchant marines. We salute them with music by Glier, the Russian sailor's dance. sea shanties were, work songs. They aren't sung much anymore. When any singing is done aboard ship today, it's apt to be the latest hit from Tin Pan Alley. One of the most famous songs identified with the sea is one that was written by two minstrel performers who probably never went to sea in their lives. 
It was sung publicly for the first time at the Booker's Theater in 1898. And since then, it's been given a going over, going over by many a resounding bass or baritone. We hear it sung this afternoon and possibly for the first time by a real seaman. Petty Officer First Class Tony DeLeva singing Asleep in the Deep. <laughs> Merchant Marine are thousands upon thousands of sea stories, more unbelievable than any ever dreamed of by Captain Marriott. The records of the merchant seamen who have delivered the goods during World War II. Each week we are privileged to bring you one of these true yarns about the iron men who sail our iron ships. We present now an incident of the invasion of Europe, told in the words of the man to whom it happened. Chief mate on the SS William Tyler Page, who signed as a supply ship during the invasion. Early in the morning, a few days after D Day, we anchored off the coast near Cherbourg to wait for daylight. Invasion or not, most of us turned in for a couple of weeks. I hadn't been asleep very long. But... Hey, that was a close one, Tom. I didn't finish. Everybody, top side, come on, men, top side. <laughs> Six survivors from there huddled in the glare of the burning ship. 
We got in alongside, took some of them aboard, but the freeze set us off. We tried again. This time our boat banged against the propeller. I thought we'd be smashed, but we managed to get the other wounded men off. Then we started back to our ship, rowing against the wind. The light, man. Yes. There's another man here in the water. Can you reach him? Yes, sir. We got him. All right, pull him aboard. He'll be overloaded if you do. Pull him aboard. Look out! We're taking on water. All right, throw all gear overboard. All water cans and rations. Look lively, man. Everything over the side. Somehow they kept their lifeboat afloat, but it took several hours to row back to the ship through that gale tossed sea. The hero of that story, Henry B. Lightman, then chief mate, now captain, is here in person to tell us the end of this story. Captain Lightman. Well, the hardest part of it came when we did get back to the ship. Where Scott was getting his wounded men aboard in stretches. But we did it. All of them were saved. Much of the credit should go to six members of my crew. Sigurd Nicolason, Russell Scott, John Quinlan, Elliot Cates, Bill Adams, and Alex Marzineski. Thank you, Captain Lightman. At this very moment, Vice Admiral Emery S. Land, War Shipping Administrator and Chairman of the U.S. Maritime Commission, is standing by in our Washington studios to award the Meritorious Service Medal to Captain Lightman. This medal was authorized in August to be presented to seamen of the Merchant Marine whose conduct and service is of a meritorious character. And Captain Lightman, this afternoon, will be the first man to receive one. The next voice you hear will be that of Vice Admiral Emery S. Land, speaking from Washington. It is a great pleasure to commend Henry B. Lightman, United States Merchant Marine, for meritorious service as set forth in the following citations. When his ship, S.S. William Tyler Page, was engaged in the Normandy landing operation, an L.S.T. loaded with troops hit a mine and was blown apart. Six of the surviving soldiers, all wounded, managed to cling to a piece of wreckage of the landing craft, which was rapidly drifting away in the heavy sea then running. Chief Mate Lightman with six of his crew manned the lifeboat and his great personal risk, and by skillful maneuvering, overhauled the drifting and tossing wreckage and rescued the six soldiers who otherwise would have perished. A copy of this commendation from meritorious service has been made part of Chief Lightman's official record. The conduct which earned Henry B. Lightman this medal is only part of his story. Though only 23 years old, Mr. Lightman is already a master, having passed his examination yesterday. It will not be long before he has a ship under his own command, which is not unusual in our merchant marine, for many of the ships which are keeping the unruly the supply lines open are under the command of officers less than 30 years of age. Merchant ships can be found wherever fighting is tough. They carried men and material into the North African beaches, into Sicily, Salerno, Anzio, Normandy, the coast of southern France, into the Solomon and the Lucian, and wherever American forces have launched amphibious assaults. There is a sweating job. Sweating out submarine attacks, sweating out mass assaults from the air, attacks from long-range coastal guns and mines, dropped by planes, sweating it out, as servicemen say, to deliver the goods. However, all this does not mean that these men do not fight when needed. They do that and do it well. They have manned guns in emergencies and fought it out with enemy submarines and planes, and will continue to do it until the last enemy surrenders unconditionally. Yes, the officers and men of the American Merchant Marine have performed meritorious service in this war, and high-ranking officers of the Army and Navy have freely acknowledged their tremendous contributions. In the post-war era, many of these officers and seamen will take part in the Merchant Marine's contributions to the rebuilding of a new world and in the interchange of commerce with the free nations of that world. We will have a peacetime merchant fleet of 15 to 20 million tons, comprise the finest vessels American shipyards can produce, a fleet which must be manned by men who can sail ships, men who have become experienced and efficient by service at sea. The American people expect, and properly so, that their merchant marine, as officers and men, which perform so gallantly and efficiently in wartime, would continue to maintain the same meritorious standards in peacetime. I want all merchant marine officers and men to remain at their task to complete the job in hand and meet the responsibilities of the future. Theirs is a task which does not end with peace. It is an American career. And now we return you to New York. We've told you a story about the old-time merchant marine and a story about the merchant marine of today. But no program of the sea would be complete without a tall tale, a sailor's yarn. 
Every nation has tall tales about a ship of a size no landlubber has ever seen. American seamen tell of a monstrous sailing vessel called the Corsair. She was so huge that no harbor in the world was large enough for her to turn around in. Her deck was so long that seamen on watch had to ride horses to get from fore to aft. One time, the Corsair was caught in a tremendous storm. She could ride out any storm, but this time there was a heavy fog that lasted for weeks. When it lifted, the captain found that the Corsair was headed south in the North Sea. This was a real predicament, because she'd pile up on the cliffs of Dover. So the skipper sent all hands over the side to soap the Corsair's side. They soaped every inch of her, and the big ship just eased through the channel. But it was such a tight fit that the cliffs of Dover scraped all the soap off the ship's starboard side. And that's why, to this very day, the cliffs of Dover are white. You have heard one of a series of service time programs which is brought to you at this same hour every day, Monday through Friday. It's Maritime. It's presented each Tuesday afternoon in cooperation with the War Shipping Administration. Music was played by the orchestra from the United States Maritime Training Station at Beachhead Bay under the direction of Warrant Officer Philip Lang. If you have ever had experience at sea, the merchant marines need you. If you are shipping now, your government wants you to continue in service. For information about signing on again, consult your maritime union or the recruitment office of the War Shipping Administration in many ports. Or write direct to Merchant Marine, Washington, D.C. And join us again next week when it's maritime. Tomorrow's service time in collaboration with the United States Army will present Wax on Parade. Ray Ovington speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.